Super Mario Bros. Wonder is finally here. Despite only being announced in June, it feels like it's been the most anticipated Nintendo Switch game for a while now. A part of the reason for that is probably due to the fact that it's been quite a long time since the last mainline 2D Mario game, and it's been even longer since we've had a 2D Mario game that was actually good. But here we are in the year 2023, where we've not only been blessed with a brand new 2D Mario, but also one which drops the new title and freshens up the formula a bit to give us something that we've not really experienced before. Before we dive in though, I want to take a second to talk about the fact that our book, A Handheld History, is now available on Amazon. It took us two years to build, and you'll be supporting an independent publication if you snag one. Check the link in the description to take a look. The story of Super Mario Bros. Wonder is about what you'd expect at this point. Mario and friends arrive in the Flower Kingdom, and upon meeting Prince Florian and exchanging pleasantries, Bowser crashes the party, steals an arbitrary collectible in order to take over the world, and it's up to you to traverse the land, reclaim the collectibles, and bring Bowser down. I suppose there's a bit of a twist this time in the way that Bowser transforms into a literal castle, but that doesn't really add much to the plot beyond making him maybe slightly more imposing than usual. I also appreciate that he isn't kidnapping Peach this time due to her being a playable character, and actually, this game features the most playable characters out of any previous 2D Mario games, having a whopping 12 of them to choose from. Admittedly, three of these are Toad variants and four are Yoshi variants, but still, that's a big roster. Most of the characters all play exactly the same, it's not like in Super Mario 3D World where each character has a unique ability, so it's basically a cosmetic choice you're making based on who you like the look of. But this actually isn't the case with the Yoshis or Nabbit, because playing as these effectively turn the game into easy mode, with them taking no damage from enemies, but having the negative effect of not being able to use power-ups. This is a great idea considering that a lot of people will be playing this with younger kids, but I do wish that this was an optional thing that you could activate across all of the characters. My favourite characters on the roster happen to be Yoshi and Nabbit, and I feel like I can't use them because I want to experience the game in what's probably considered the intended way, with the damage and power-ups being active. So that's a bit of a bummer, but I'm sure I'll get over it. But let's stop nitpicking about the characters and story, and get into the reason that we're all here. What's the actual gameplay like? This game is an absolute delight. Nintendo once again proved that they're at the top of the class here by creating a game which feels familiar in a lot of ways, but mixing up the formula to such an extent that you never know what's going to happen next. The big gimmick with Super Mario Bros. Wonder is based around the Wonder Flower collectibles. There's one of these placed in every main level of the game, and whenever you touch one, the world around you transforms in some way, offering a completely new gameplay style, dramatically altering the level design, or giving you a much greater degree of challenge. It's impossible to predict exactly what's going to happen when you touch one of these. Sometimes you'll inflate and slowly float up into space while having to avoid obstacles looking to pop you. Other times, piranha plants will start bursting from pipes and sing a musical number as you move forward and attempt to avoid them. And sometimes a whole stampede of bulrush enemies will appear and start blasting through the level as you ride on top of them. I won't ruin all of the surprises here, because a massive part of the game involves being caught off guard by what you're going to experience. It's not only these Wonder Flower sections that make the game stand out though. Even the standard, unaltered levels offer an unprecedented level of variety for a 2D Mario game, with all of them throwing something fresh at you. I don't think I've come across a single level which feels like it's rehashing the same ideas. Even on the very infrequent occasion a level does revisit a particular mechanic, it completely recontextualizes it, or uses it in a far more challenging way, which makes it feel distinct. A lot of the time, this variety is implemented into the levels through a new type of enemy, new power-up, or new element of the level which can be interacted with in some way. For example, there's this level which has these platforms which can only be jumped on a certain number of times before they disappear. 
This is then combined with falling enemies which reduce that number if they land on the platform. So you've got to balance defeating and avoiding enemies while also avoiding jumping around too much. Then you've got this level where there's these hoppy cat enemies which will jump whenever you jump. This forces you to pay extra attention to your movement and the placement of enemies in order to avoid taking damage. And on top of all of this, there's also the new power-ups, like turning into an elephant, being able to shoot bubbles, and getting a drill hat. Despite the elephant power-up being a massive part of the game's marketing, it's arguably the most mechanically boring of all of the power-ups. It basically just gives you a short-ranged trunk attack and allows you to suck up water and shoot it at flowers to reveal items. The most interesting power-up is probably the drill hat, which allows you to dig underground and pass under enemies and find secret areas. You can even use this to drill into walls and the ceiling, which allows for some interesting vertical level design. The game is filled to the brim with ideas like this, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that every single level features something new. Adding to the already insane level of variety on offer here is the plethora of bonus levels. There's a load of different types of bonus levels here, from KO arenas where you need to run through a gauntlet of enemies and defeat them as fast as possible to get the best prize. There's search party challenges where you need to find five extremely cleverly hidden tokens to finish the level. There's your more standard bite-sized levels which consist of a short platforming challenge. And then we also have the badge challenges. These badge challenges are different from normal bonus levels because these revolve around mastering a particular equipable ability which this game calls a badge. These badges can give you access to passive abilities, like getting more coins for defeating enemies, or being able to survive a fall into a pit or lava a single time during a level. But the more important badges give you access to new movement abilities, such as floating through the air with your cap, getting an additional boost of height when you kick off of a wall, or even gaining a super high crouch jump move. On paper, this is a great idea, but I'm actually a little bit conflicted on this whole badge system. It's a great idea in concept, but it's somewhat constricted by the fact that you can only equip one of them at a time, and you're free to use whichever you want across any level. This means that a lot of the badges feel incredibly underutilized because the level design can't require the use of them because the developers know that every player will have a different badge equipped. I almost wonder if a better system would have been to have scrapped the passive badges entirely and had you unlock new abilities as permanent upgrades which then stack on top of each other, slowly expanding your moveset as you play through the game. That way the later levels could take into consideration that you have access to every single one of these moves and create even more complex platforming challenges based on that. The overarching issue with the current badge system is that you're not going to bother using the more context sensitive badges because not every level needs them. So for the most part, you're just going to end up using something like the floating cap because it's by far the one that comes in most handy across every level. Whereas something like the dolphin kick ability only works underwater and there's not that many levels where you're actually in the water. Beyond the standard levels and bonus levels though, you also have the boss levels, and unfortunately this is probably where the game is at its weakest. Not only do I think that the boss fights are far too easy, but they're also very repetitive and don't even feature interesting characters. The main boss levels have you fight against Bowser Jr, who uses the power of the wonder seeds he's stolen to give him powers that alter the boss arena in certain ways. The problem is that his attacks always just revolve around him spinning around in his shell for a while and then popping out, leaving himself vulnerable to attack, and then rinsing and repeating. The arena changing doesn't really affect the fight as much as I would like, and I would have also liked for these fights to have had the same degree of shock value that the main levels have. It would have helped if they had made some new interesting characters to battle against, but instead it's just the standard Bowser Jr, Kamek, and the rest of the crew that we've seen a million times before. Another element of the game I feel could have potentially been altered slightly is with the main side collectible. Every level features a number of wonder seeds, which are the main collectible required to unlock the path forward in order to progress through the game. These are perfectly fine because they have an obvious use and there's a reason to go out of your way to collect them. The issue that I have is with the purple coins, of which there's normally three per level and often these are the most difficult things to collect. 
either because they're placed in difficult positions or require you to find and explore secret optional areas. The issue is that the only thing to spend these on are at the poplin shops, where you can exchange them for a limited number of wonder seeds, badges with passive effects, or something the game calls standees. These standees are clearly the main thing you're supposed to spend your purple coins on, and despite it being satisfying slowly filling in a big checklist of them, they don't really do anything particularly interesting, and in my opinion, this reduces the value of the purple coins. I would have preferred the poplin shops to offer more variety of unlockables, like maybe it could have had costumes for the characters, Super Mario Odyssey style, or something like that. While we're on the topic of the standees though, I should probably actually explain what they do, which actually ties into a more major component of the game, which is of course, multiplayer. It's sort of expected at this point that a 2D Mario game will feature local multiplayer options, and of course, Super Mario Bros. Wonder is no exception to this, allowing for up to four players to run through the Flower Kingdom together. This actually works slightly differently to the new Super Mario Bros. games though, by not allowing you to jump on each other's heads, pick up and throw each other, or even collide with each other in any way. This makes the game much less chaotic and closer to the single player experience and arguably makes it a better co-op game in general. However, I do have to admit that the chaos caused by the fact that you could get in each other's way so much in the new Super Mario Bros games is partially what made them so fun. They were absolutely infuriating to play with more than one player, but I feel like that's where a lot of the enjoyment was found. Maybe that's just me though. Either way, the more interesting element of multiplayer in Super Mario Bros. Wonder comes from the online component. Not only does the game feature online co-op with friends as well as a competitive race mode to see who can finish the level the fastest, but it also has a passive multiplayer mode, which is somewhat similar to how Dark Souls works. And no, I'm not just saying that for the memes either. Basically, you can turn on an online mode, which allows you to see the ghosts of other players who are roaming the world at the same time as you. These ghosts are people playing the game alongside you in real time, and this has the strange effect of making it feel like you're taking part in this community experience, despite the fact you're literally playing the game in single player mode. Playing in this mode has some additional benefits though, because you can actually interact with other players' worlds, and they can interact with yours. The main thing here is that if you lose a 1-up, you'll turn into a ghost, and then you can be revived if you make it to another player and they touch you. This actually allows you to completely cheese certain levels, because you can grab a collectible, fall into a pit, get revived, and keep the collectible. You can obviously choose to not do this and just give up rather than being revived, but it's another way that the game offers a help in hand if you're struggling. A couple of other ways that you can interact with these other players is by giving them your extra power-ups to offer a help in hand, or by placing the standees that I mentioned earlier, which will appear in their world, and can revive them if they turn into a ghost, basically acting the same as being touched by another player. So the idea here is that if you place these in a difficult area, you could be helping out loads of other players by allowing them to quickly respawn if they mess up. Now, you might be wondering what the benefit of doing all of this is, because just being a nice, helpful citizen of the Flower Kingdom just isn't enough for you, you greedy little cretin. Well, luckily for you, there's this online ranking system which goes up the more that you help other players. So you can show off just how helpful you are if you choose to play in this online mode. It doesn't actually unlock anything, it's just this additional thing to aim for while you're playing the game as normal, and I think it's a nice touch. I actually love this online aspect of the game. It ends up making the levels feel even more alive and dynamic than they already are, but if you opted to just not use this online mode at all, it wouldn't feel like anything was missing either. The game is great with or without this, but it's just a nice little extra that I'm really glad they implemented. Super Mario Bros. Wonder is incredible. Its greatest strength lies in its unexpected twists and turns with its superb level design, but what makes it something special is everything that ties it together. The graphics are phenomenal and the character animations are way more expressive than ever before, which gives everyone way more personality than usual. 
The soundtrack is filled with catchy, upbeat tracks that will stick in your head for days, and there's even a greater emphasis on humour, which mostly comes from the flower NPCs who make comments as you run by them or encounter them in different situations. This is such a well-crafted experience, and it's going to be incredibly difficult to top. Any criticisms I have boil down to minor nitpicks considering how great the rest of the game is, but I do wish I could play as Yoshi and Nabbit without forcing me into an easy mode. I also think that the badge system is slightly flawed in the way that the levels don't utilise them enough. The purple coins could have done with something else to use them for, and the bosses are a bit too easy and repetitive for my liking. But it's so easy to overlook these shortcomings when there's so much that it gets right. Personally, I would go as far as to say that Super Mario Bros. Wonder is the best 2D Mario game ever made, and it's definitely a must-have title for the Nintendo Switch. But let me know how you've been feeling about Super Mario Bros. Wonder so far. Have you been enjoying it, and what's been your favourite thing about it so far? Also, do you agree that it could be the best 2D Mario game ever made? And if not, what is? As always though, give the video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe for more retro goodness coming very very soon, remember to check out A Handheld History which is now available on Amazon, links in the description, and I've been Rob from Retro Dodo and I'll see you in the next one.